Great. Uh, thanks for joining me, everybody. Uh, so for today, we're going to be talking about my team uh, we, and the product that we build and basically how we bought into the promise of microservices and admittedly maybe a little bit of the hype. Uh, we're going to be kind of going over the lessons we've learned over the first year or two of uh, working on that and tools for what you, what you can do, how you can approach problems after the shiny coat of new paint wears off and you're left with the remainder. So first up, let me give you a little background. Uh, make sure you know what Yelp is. So Yelp, uh, if you're not aware, is uh, an app, or if you're feeling a little old-fashioned, a website, uh, where you can go and basically figure out what local businesses near you are really good at what they do. Uh, and it's not a small number of local businesses, so we have about 70 million reviews uh, and 140 million monthly unique users. So really uh, a lot of content, a lot of depth there. And as well as depth, we've also got a fair bit of breadth. So most of you might associate Yelp with restaurant reviews, uh, and that is a very popular use case, uh, but we actually have a lot of other businesses on Yelp and a lot of other content uh, to look at. So shopping is our largest category, but we have a fairly wide spread, and in general, our goal is to make sure that if you can find a business on the street and it has a storefront, we want to make sure it's on Yelp and you can uh, find out information and find out uh, good things about it. So for myself, uh, I'm Scott. If you're inclined to use Twitter, you can find me at Scott Trillia on there. I've been at Yelp for four years now, working on backend systems, spent a lot of that time on the search team, but have worked on a variety of different applications, machine learning, uh, a lot of work with locations and geocoding, and I've also spent a lot of time both uh, developing infrastructure for our service stack at Yelp and being a consumer of that service stack. But the team I'm going to be talking to you about today is uh, called the Transaction Platform Team, and it corresponds directly to a product that Yelp provides called the Yelp Transaction Platform. So let's talk through a little bit of what that means. And in general, if you hear me referring to just platform, this is what I'm talking about. All right, so what is platform? Uh, our goal, in short, is to make sure that for all of those great businesses that we have on Yelp, as much as possible, we can actually connect users directly to their goods or their services. Uh, so if you're at home hungry after a long day and you're looking for some delivery, you might search on Yelp to figure out which places are good to go. And if you decide that what you're really in the mood for is uh, Nick's Crispy Tacos, and you go to that business, we want to give you the opportunity with the platform product and the platform team to go ahead and just click and get whatever that good or service that Nick's Crispy Tacos provides. Uh, in this case, hopefully, Nick's Crispy Tacos is going to be giving you something like a carne asada taco or maybe some uh, chips and guacamole, whatever's appropriate. Uh, however, we don't only have uh, places that serve tacos on Yelp, so of course we also partner with a number of other third parties to provide other uh, types of goods and services. So you can find some clothing, uh, we partner with Shoptiques, or you can find a hotel booking, we partner with Hipmunk, uh, as well as a number of other partners and, and different types of product verticals. And then the goal is regardless, you can go ahead and check out on Yelp, uh, pay with some stored information so you don't have to you know, be re-entering it on 19 different websites and establishing all those different logins and get that thing that you were looking for in the first place. So that's a little bit about the team. Uh, the, only, the only other point of order is making sure we're all on the same term with microservices. Uh, just a quick show of hands, has anybody in this room not been to at least one talk with the word microservices involved this week? <laughs> okay, that's kind of what I thought. So uh, yeah, to say it's a hot trend might be a bit understating it. It's pretty recent, uh, at least in this exact term, if not the general concept. Uh, but Honestly, it's hard to avoid at this point. You're probably familiar with it. That said, let's go over basic terms so nobody's uh, wildly off base. So I like Martin Fowler's definition. Uh, you can read words yourself, uh, but I want to just point out a couple of them that I find particularly insightful. So he focuses on microservices as being a suite of small services. So you're going to have a few of them, and you're hopefully aiming for them not to grow out of control. Uh, he also wants them to be in their own processes and running, uh, communicating with lightweight mechanisms. So in our case at Yelp, this is things like HTTP, JSON, uh, separate web servers, things like that. So this is mostly by contrast to monoliths, uh, and this is sort of the traditional term for the single uh, app. All of your code in one place, uh, all of it being deployed uh, together atomically, 
and working from there. Um, I would say if you ever hear the word monolith and you hear people talking about their monolith or your monolith or anything like this, I would really encourage you to clarify what kind of monolith are they talking about. Uh, it's a very generic term for a lot of different kinds of systems. If I do a little hobby, you know, a Rails app, that's technically a monolith. And in Yelp's case, if we have uh, a million lines of code in a single code base, that's also a monolith. There's some slight qualitative differences between those two. Uh, so in Yelp's case, our monolith was big. Uh, like I said, million lines of code, million lines of tests. Uh, we had hundreds of developers working on it. And you can imagine uh, the, the sort of problems you have when it comes to a monolith of that size, an amount of code of that size, that much cooperation in a single code base. Things get a little messy. And that's basically what we saw at Yelp. And that's what led us to go to a service-based architecture. So what is, what is bad about these monoliths? I don't want to just uh, assume this is a given. i am say a few brief points, and then we'll move on on the assumption you've already heard this a few times. Uh, first off, one big problem we had was monolithic Python code was really resisting decoupling. Uh, we all know that we would like different parts of our application to stay different parts of our application, to not be tied together accidentally or on purpose. Uh, unfortunately, despite the best efforts, trust me, uh, we found this was extremely hard and basically completely unrealistic to attain in a single code base. You might be objecting, you might be saying, well, I know, you know, Scott, I know about all these things, ZOP interfaces and all sorts of great tools that you could use to decouple your code base. Trust me, we thought of it. We, in fact, even thought we didn't need to go to microservices or to service-based architecture at first, and we basically found through a very expensive series of tests that we actually did. So it uh, is surprising how much it resists decoupling and best efforts in that direction. In addition, it has the bad habit of catering to the lowest common denominator. So uh, we had the case in uh, our monolith, we called it Yelp main, uh, where there were a number of old libraries. You know, we've been writing code for a decade in this uh, application. It's, it's got some age to it. And so you might imagine the occasional upgrade needs to happen to something like SQL Alchemy or, or what have you. Uh, and it turns out that the oldest and scariest and darkest corners of your code base that nobody likes and nobody wants to talk about and certainly nobody wants to change are exactly the things that are going to hold back the parts that he actually need to move quickly. Uh, and so we found that we were being limited on libraries, we were being limited on choice of languages. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to run in Python 3? Well, it turns out when you have to port a million lines of code to do that, it's a significant undertaking and you're being held back by all these parts of your code base that you don't really want to be held back by. And finally, monolithic Python code is really the opposite of being agile. Uh, we wanted to be pushing multiple times of day to production. We wanted to be running tests quickly and nimbly. We found ourselves doing neither of those things and moving in uh, the opposite direction that you would want to be as far as whether those are getting better or worse. Uh, and basically, this was what really drove us to say, it's fine, it's time. So we started doing services. Uh, circa 2011, actually about when I joined the company. And this is uh, just the cumulative graph of number of services over time. You can basically, my whole point here is it started pretty rapidly, it continued rapidly, and it hasn't stopped anytime soon. Uh, this includes greenfield development, this includes slicing pieces off of the monolith and pulling them out into services. And this, this feels awesome. Like this, this is, this, especially the first part of this graph, is an amazing part of, of sort of the best uh, feelings of microservices, the best benefits, all the things you see in a nice slide deck when somebody is presenting uh, why you should move to this architecture. That's what you feel in the first you know, uh, six months to a year of this. And it was amazing. Fast code pushes, actually having isolated systems, and being free of these ancient dependencies that we didn't care about. So uh, my team, when we built our system, said, man, that sounds like a pretty sweet deal. Uh, we can have this horrible old creaky monolith idea that has been proven to be um, really painful and terrible, or we can have this really nice new setup, this microservices, everybody's talking about it. Uh, you know, admittedly, it sounds kind of cool. I like to write cool things. And so we really bought into this. We had this idea of what it was going to be when we finished, and it sounded pretty excellent. Um, so it was, it was a little bit surprising, a little bit um, concerning and upsetting when we actually built that, scaled it out for a year, and we looked back and, and realized, you know, that thing that we built, what we actually came up with, it didn't really look a lot like what we had been promised, right? <laughs> like, you can, you can kind of see, you can see where we were in the right direction. We had, like, the rough concept. Uh, you can even recognize individual features. Maybe our pushes got slightly faster, 
or maybe we had some, uh, some good luck with getting some isolation, but like the whole picture, having it all work together exactly as we were told, that was not happening, right? And that was pretty frustrating. So let's talk a little bit about why that is. Uh, very briefly, we saw a lot of problems as we grew, grew larger and really got embedded in this, this service-based architecture. Uh, our API complexity increased, so those nice isolated services that made sense and did one thing well started to do a few things kind of okay, uh, which is a lot less compelling, it turns out. We, we perversely saw coupling rise, right? The whole reason we did this in the first place was because I was tired of being coupled to something I didn't care about. Uh, it turns out it's kind of really hard to build a product, continue to evolve your product organically, and not accidentally couple yourself back to everything that you try to get away from. The interactions between the systems get really murky. Uh, when I call a function, I can read that function, I can dig into its contents, it's running in my process, I have some guarantees about what it's about to do. But when I call an external uh, API, third party, even worse, who knows what it's gonna do, right? Being able to say confidently what it does or does not do turns out to be extremely hard. And finally, all those processes that we talked about, pushing, deploying, testing, being confident that things are working in production, uh, none of what we were used to doing was scaling up to this system of services, and that hurt. In fact, that was actually exactly the opposite of what we were trying to do with this whole idea. So that kind of brings us to the topic of this talk, which is great. Uh, I bought into the hype, right? I bought into what I was, what I was told was gonna be awesome, and I was convinced that it was gonna be awesome. I implemented it more or less as, as told, and a year later, I'm finding myself left with the exact same problems. Why is my code coupling to things I don't care about again? Why aren't my tests fast? That was the entire point of this thing, right? Why can't I deploy regularly every day? Uh, and so I wanna kinda give you some, some hard-won tools that we've, uh, some that we've built, some that we've learned, uh, to sort of attack these problems and to be able to leave you with the good parts of services and hopefully be able to uh, work through and improve the bad parts. So to do that, we're gonna talk about four main areas. Uh, Curiously, you might note that all of these areas are kind of in the bullet list of benefits of services in the first place. Uh, it turns out there's a really nice initial spike when you move to services where these all get a lot better than they used to be in the monolith. And then there's a really nasty plateau or even dip depending on the details of your system right after that. Uh, so we're gonna kind of talk about how to avoid that plateau, how to get over that dip with each one of them. So first up, let's talk about decoupling. There's this old boring problem, right? I have a monolithic ball of spaghetti code. Uh, what are you gonna do about it? Well, if you've been paying any attention, there's an easy answer here, right? The solution is microservices. What, what, what are you even doing here? Like, th this is so well-worn at this point, it's not, not worth going into more detail on. Unfortunately, from the perspective of, of coupling, we have other problems now. Uh, my services are absolutely gonna share concepts. You can't get away from this. That's arguably the entire point. So when they share concepts, how can I do that in a maintainable way? And when I now have all of these distributed systems, some of which I control, some of which maybe my colleagues control, uh, what in the world do I do when I need to refactor something? Now you're in a real spot. So we're gonna kind of walk through basically a case study of one particular problem we had and talk a little bit about where we ended up on it. And that concept is called a service type. Uh, I will give you the convenient and uh, mostly true definition, which is a service type tells us what product a particular business provides and how they provide it, okay? And for a, a, a team that does fulfillment for a variety of different verticals, this is a pretty core concept. So when we launched, we launched with food, okay? These were the early days. We're just gonna start, we're gonna keep it simple, get a nice MVP out and see if the idea has merit. We're not gonna make it too complicated, we're not gonna overgeneralize. What are our service types? Well, that pick up and delivery, right? That seems reasonable. You're either gonna pick up food from the business or you're gonna deliver it, and that's gonna uh, be the only definitions of service types that we have. Okay, uh, our product did well, we're growing, we wanna expand, let's uh, do something new. So we're gonna do appointment booking, okay? Like pick up and delivery, these uh, have a couple options. So we're gonna name them booking at business and booking at customer. We've, we've learned, you'll note, we don't call it a generic pick up and delivery because it's not generic. It's booking at business and booking at customer. So here's the learning curve. We're really uh, accelerating. And you, know, you, you go through another year of growth and success, honestly, and what you find is that this is a complete mess. Like what, what's going on here? Um, let's just pick a couple of these. If you look at hotel reservation and booking at business, 
I'd be curious if we took a poll of the audience, if anybody, like if, if the majority could successfully tell me the difference between those two. And why, why do we have goods at customer and delivery? Isn't delivery goods at customer? Like, this stuff is nonsense, right? And this is where we found ourselves. Uh, and we honestly, we kind of got there because it was convenient, right? And it made sense to us. So I want to digress briefly uh, into an architectural diagram just so that what I'm about to say makes a lot more sense and you have context for it. Uh, this is roughly what the high-level architecture looks like of our system. We'll uh, quickly walk through it and then go ahead and explain how it relates back to service types. So we have front end, right? These are things that face users, web pages, menu views, checkout pages. It communicates with fulfillment in the center. Fulfillment's essentially uh, keeping track of order state. Are you ready to be charged? Are you ready to be delivered, et cetera? Uh, the important bit on the right is payments, kind of essential to the whole process. And then we have a big loop in the system, essentially. Fulfillment decides that something needs to be done to an order, and it does it. It notifies the partners, third parties, which I will say this a few times, we do not control. So these are external companies with opaque implementations. Uh, they're gonna call back through the partner API and say, cool, your order is ready to be charged, we do some work, and we kind of keep this loop going, feedback between us and the partner. So that's the rough architecture. And uh, a couple things of note, in yellow on the right, these are systems we don't control. Uh, these are internal systems we don't control. Partners, external systems we don't control. Uh, the front end here is actually all back in the monolith because a dirty little secret of migrating your code out of a monolith, you usually don't completely migrate your code out of a monolith. Uh, so front end, for reasons, uh, is still locked in that code base. So we have complications here, right? We have a lot of uh, sort of history that you know, it would take me an hour to explain to you properly. And uh, this whole system is, is messy. It's messy from the start. So highlighted in red here are all the pieces of the system that knew about service types. And when I say no, I mean I saw the code and they all cared a lot, right? We're not talking about like I'm passing it along to my, uh, my friend downstream. We're talking about I'm making important functionality breaking decisions based on this data. Uh, partners aren't red, but that's just because I don't know what partners do. Realistically, we have no control over what they do with service type, and that's uh, equally terrifying if, if a little different. So this concept in general was really confusing. Uh, it was pervasive, alarmingly so, far more than we ever intended it to be. And it was really convenient, right? This was something that we used all over the place to make decisions, to use if statements, you know. This was very useful to us, but it wasn't designed, and that was really the core problem. So I wanna kinda of talk about how we approached this and, and I wanna preface right off the bat with saying we needed to do a refactor, we needed to do it across all of these systems and we knew we couldn't completely eliminate the concept. Those were the constraints we were given. So it's uh, not a great spot to start from in a hard refactoring project. And our approach was basically we're gonna draw boundaries, we're gonna introduce some domain specific concepts, things that make more sense to the system they're in than this vague service type thing that I couldn't even explain very well to you. And we're gonna make sure those concepts are tied to functionality, right? And this is sort of the domain-driven design concept that if in a system you're using uh, words, vocabulary, concepts that are consistent with the system, your code's gonna look a lot nicer. So I don't wanna go into detail of the refactor because it was long, painful, and boring, right? This is uh, five different services with interfaces across to all the other services. Service type was in an alarming number of them, and it was just hard mechanical work. Uh, what I do want to note is our eventual solution was to basically corral it into the smallest space we could in the system, and then write little adapter layers to concepts that made more sense for those systems. So we don't control partners, we had to keep service type for them, although maybe someday we would deprecate it. Uh, but in the rest of the system, we were able to basically transform this into something that made more sense locally and was more maintainable in the long term. So what lessons can we draw? First off, and, and this might be like the most enlightening thing we discovered, interfaces are not just your APIs, right? Interfaces are everything that's shared across system, and it's alarming how many things are secretly shared across your systems. Uh, we got bit not because service type was a resource on five services, but because it was that little add-on parameter on the end of 15 different service calls. Uh, this was something that was convenient to us, and we didn't really examine it closely. So be very aware of what you're sharing and just be intentional about it. And if one day you have to refactor, know that it will be very expensive. That's unfortunately what comes with a service-based architecture. 
In addition, sacrificing this dryness was uh, really a good choice in this case. Uh, it is not always the best choice, and I think by default most of us are pretty uncomfortable with repetition in code, but it's a tool you have in your tool belt. Be aware of where it could help you out. And one of the places it helped us out in this case was at service interface boundaries. It's a natural place for decoupling, so if you're going to do something, that's a pretty convenient place to do it. All right, let's talk about uh, defining, and by defining, I mean our interfaces in particular. Have you ever needed to understand something and been told to go read the source? I assume yes. Um, it's a pretty common retort, right? I'm busy, go read the source. Okay, maybe it has its place. How does that work in a, in a network of services? How does that work if I don't own the service I'm supposed to be reading the source of, or if I don't speak the language it's written in? It kind of gets a little gross. Uh, what happens if I want to know your ser services interface, but I don't actually know if you validate it properly or at all? Uh, does that mean your interface is the one you wrote down, or the one you told me, or the one you actually validate in practice, uh, or all of them, or none of them? How does this work? And the fact is, coming from our Python monolith, honestly, our interfaces were bad. This is, this is a cultural thing. This is a habit thing. Uh, Python is not the strictest language when it comes to defining interfaces clearly, right? If you want to write bad interfaces, Python is, is thrilled to let you do so. Uh, Say what you will about that. I think that's just a fact of life that we live in, and we need to be very aware of it when we're moving into situations where the importance of interface increases, okay? Um, I like this example. This looks like kind of the kind of Python code you might show to somebody, right? This is like pretty Python. Look how elegant it is, right? We have, uh, we have some quarg usage. That's good. I'm getting points in my, my expert Python user uh, column. We've got some validation. Everybody loves validation and we have very nicely named methods. Uh, this is an important interface for us, right? We wanna be very clear about what is or is not happening here. Unfortunately, I'm willing to bet nobody in this room can say with any certainty what's actually happening here. What is order, right? It has an attribute, that's what we know. Uh, what are in those quarks and what in the world are they doing to the users? Uh, and, and really overall, just what, what are we staying with this interface? We don't know, we don't know. And this is the habits that we had gotten into from the monolith from working in a single Python code base. So we attacked this problem with something called Swagger. Um, Swagger is an API description language. It is essentially a spec for what your API is. Uh, if you heard Lynn Root's lightning talk a couple days ago, I think, on RAML, Swagger and RAML are sort of uh, uh, slight variations on each other, different implementations, different design choices. So we chose this uh, with three main goals in mind. We wanted to make sure that we documented our system for ourselves, uh, both for people on other teams and for the people who are writing the interfaces. We wanted to make sure uh, that we made our clients smarter in as much as was smart and wise to do so, and we wanted to make our servers smarter. So what is required for Swagger? Uh, in short, you need to write a gigantic spec. Right? You need to describe your API. What endpoints do you have? What arguments do they take? What responses can they return? Maybe a doc string or two, you know, really scary stuff. Um, you might be kind of laughing to yourself and thinking, well, this is, why are you making a big deal out of this? I was astonished at how hard this was. This is really hard to do. If you give your, your best developers on a service the job of writing a spec to this level, for their service, they won't know how to do it. They'll have to look it up in code. They'll have to back it out. They'll have to reverse engineer it. Because if you don't do this from the start, you don't know your API. And you might think you do, and that's almost more terrifying. So this is the work you have to do. It's not a lot of fun. I wasn't a big fan of it when I did it for our API. Uh, better to do up front, there's a hint for you. So what do you get out of it? That's the real question. Uh, first up, Swagger has a great set of tools. Uh, Swagger UI is essentially a pretty view on that same data we just showed you. You can click around, you see shiny colors, you get to interact with the API and see some sample responses. On the client side, we have a library called Bravado, and the goal of Bravado is to basically be, again, consuming that API from some remote service, learning about what that service is actually offering in terms of its endpoints, in terms of its types, and doing all the annoying mechanical work for you that you don't want to be doing by hand. Uh, we maintained client libraries, pa you know, Python packages for a long time that did this themselves, and they did it wrong, and they did it incompletely, and they didn't validate, and they had many other issues. Uh, it's a hard job to do right. 
this is aimed at basically making all the mechanical difficult parts go away. And on the server, we also have something equivalent. So uh, I have a library called Pyramid Swagger that essentially hooks into the Pyramid uh, web framework. Uh, if you're using that, if you're not, there are equivalents for other, for other uh, frameworks. And its goal is to do the equivalent on the server side. So what does that look like? That looks like serving the Swagger schema uh, at something like slash API docs so that other things can access it. That looks like applying validation because you've defined your entire spec, remember, and you don't have to rewrite that validation or do it incorrectly. Uh, and there's also a variety of other sort of uh, smaller tricks and goodies available. So what lessons can we pull from this? First off, your interfaces should be intentional. Don't patch them on piece by piece. Don't build it halfway and then slap together the rest of it. Uh, think of it as a whole because if you don't, it will become a complete mess, I guarantee it. We, we've seen this like clockwork for every API that doesn't get a regular, basically redesign at least, whether or not you actually implement it, thinking about it from top to bottom, figuring out what the new concepts are and what concepts are outdated. It's an important process. Your interfaces need to be explicit. Uh, this is a thing that sounds very attractive when I say it out loud and people don't really like doing when they have to actually implement it in code. Uh, but there's no shortcut here. If your, implement, if your implementation is not uh, explicit in what your interface is, you're gonna still have an interface, you just don't know what it is, right? You can't make smart decisions based on it, and you're gonna eventually get bit and bitten hard when you accidentally uh, break backwards compatibility because you had no idea what you were actually uh, changing. And finally, find the mechanical things about this process and automate them mercilessly, okay? And I say mechanical pointedly here because one thing that we didn't do was uh, automate away the network, right? We didn't hide the network in that Swagger client. Uh, and that was due to some hard lessons where we kind of automated away the network and we discovered that that was uh, a dead end and a very uh, dangerous area to go down. But all the mechanical stuff, all the stuff you can completely know and uh, unabashedly automate away, you should do so. Okay, so let's talk about production. We've kind of talked about design, decoupling. What's it like getting this thing actually running in practice? This is a real customer bug report. Your customers might give you bug reports that look similarly. Uh, it says, I was using your API. I'm a good, good bug reporter, so I tell you which API endpoint I was using, and I saw a 504. Uh, it happened yesterday. There you go, right? Uh, go fix it for me, right? This is your job. My job is to report the bugs. Your job is to fix the bugs. What can, what can you do with a system like this? What can you honestly uh, go for? There are a few approaches um, in, in ancient times. You might pull in your most experienced developer, stick them in a room, tell them they saw some 504s coming from that away, and hope that they can just kind of grab whatever logs are lying around and, and fill in the details, right? And I don't know, my, my poor analogy here is that this is, this is kind of like picking up a random bookshelf and hoping it's gonna help you on a research project. Like, okay, it might, yeah, you might get lucky and find some things that are relevant, but you're also gonna pick up just whatever this person had lying around. And if you're using whatever logs your company or your, your team happened to create previously, you're gonna be getting stuff that was built for a different purpose. Uh, it doesn't really work very well. Okay, fine. Let's build our own logs, right? Let's log all of our APIs. We have a bunch of services. We're gonna know every request that comes in, every response that goes out. We're gonna nail this. Great, well, uh, so there are some obvious upsides to this problem. You no longer don't have the data, and there are some obvious downsides. This is your job, right? Go find me the pattern in uh, all of this data and do it by tomorrow, because you know, I'm not paying you to just sit around and look through data. Um, this is technically possible. If you have some you know, command line gurus, you might be able to whip out a crazy one-liner that involves five different uses of grep and, and manage, but I don't really recommend it. Uh, what we've kind of settled on is both logging everything we know about uh, and getting tooling to basically examine it efficiently. And for us, that's ended up being Elasticsearch and Kibana. This uh, may be an old, an old story to you. It's certainly a, a very popular choice. You'll often hear it uh, in a connection with this guy here, Logstash, and collectively this is called the ELK stack. Um, if you're completely unfamiliar with it, I'm not gonna really do a good job of explaining it, but I would encourage you to go investigate it because it's frankly pretty awesome. So what do we use it for? Well, Kibana lets you build dashboards, Elasticsearch stores the log data. That's the, the long and the short of it. Uh, so what we've mostly found is it's tremendous what you learn about your system when you log data in production and you actually look at it. It's not a lot more complicated than that. Uh, we did nothing more complicated than showing ourselves a graph over time of all the API hits broken down by partner. That's all this is. 
So uh, that big spike of blue in the middle is a partner that has decided this is their pattern of hitting our API. This kind of blew our mind. Uh, if you had asked us all beforehand, we would have said, yeah, they're all doing exactly or more or less what we told them in the API documentation. I'm sure there's not anything too weird in there, right? Because we were really specific when we wrote that documentation, and it's totally clear what they're supposed to do. Uh, well, in practice, no, right? Our documentation is less clear than we think, and their implementation is, is subject to their implementation goals. You can also learn great things about your errors. So when you push out that bad code and you see a spike of I can't talk to your service errors, um, you at least have a way of viewing it now. And this is uh, definitely a step up from tailing a log somewhere and piping it through grep and making sure you don't uh, write the wrong regular expression. So this kind of stuff is permanent and you can share around links and it's very nice. But how does it help us solve that mystery for 504? So uh, you're not gonna be able to read this, but this is a dashboard you can create quite easily. And the real trick here is uh, even though by default these dashboards are gonna be a view over all of our log data, we can write queries to whittle that down. We can add filters to clarify what we're looking for. So in quite small text up at the top, we basically said I want only results that have the method path, you know, user info, that they're hitting that part of the API, and I want everything that doesn't have a 200 status code in response. Okay, not complicated. Um, turns out, in this particular day, we were doing pretty well, and we got exactly one of those, and that was the customer complaint. So this is the kind of thing that would have uh, been, I'm not gonna say impossible, but it would have been particularly unpleasant and inefficient under raw uh, data formats, and it's quite nice when you have tooling like this. In fact, for this problem, we dug a little deeper, and using uh, basically the same setup, we were able to say, hey, if we split out timings by data center, uh, one of them looks a little slower than the others, and that's the source of all these timeouts. So really it's hard to overstate over, uh, how much value you're gonna get out of just logging the, what's happening in production and being able to view it efficiently. And realistically, we don't want our customers to have to be telling us these things in the first place. That's a little bit inefficient and it leads to its own problems. So we have a monitoring tool that we've open sourced at Yelp called ElastAlert. And what ElastAlert essentially does is it sits on top of Elasticsearch and it uh, does three things. You tell it first, what is the Elasticsearch instance I'm looking for and what's the index named? Where am I looking, basically? You tell it what sort of uh, constraints you want to apply. So in our case, we're saying I want to see at least 20 errors in two minutes, although this language is rich and you can say many things. And then finally, we take some sort of action. So what's gonna basically happen with this rule is if we see 20 errors in two minutes, we're gonna go ahead and page on call. We're gonna say, hey, there are more errors than we'd like and maybe we can insert a nice graph link that says here's something that will help you uh, understand more about the problem. Okay, lessons learned. Uh, first up, logging, it's honestly a superpower. Uh, this stuff is awesome and it's gonna be amazing for you. I can't really overstate how important this has been for us and I would say it's night and day uh, since before we started using it extensively. That raw data is not enough either. You do need to visualize it, and ideally you need to be proactively monitoring on it just so that you can be spending your time doing what you care about rather than digging through mountains and mountains of raw text logs. And overall, these approaches have made a world of difference. Uh, these took our incident responses from days, I mean, we had to wait to get an email from a customer for that one, uh, down to minutes, right? We're getting paged the moment this stuff happens. And it took the investigations figuring out why something went wrong from basically arbitrarily long, because maybe we just never could figure it out, uh, down to something much, much quicker. Okay, I'm uh, gonna go ahead and skip the last one because I'm straight out of time. But I wanna talk overall about some sort of lessons we've learned and, and how to wrap this up. Uh, oh, there we go, all right. So overall, how can you approach problems like this? Uh, frankly, the first step is you really need to understand where you're coming from. Uh, you need to understand the system you came from before, in our case, this big monolith, a million lines of Python code and all that implies, and you have to factor that into the decisions you're making. If you're ignoring that, you're gonna make mistakes based on those weaknesses. Uh, this isn't anything new, but it's, it's an important thing to keep in mind. Services aren't exempt from this. They're not a magic cure-all for all your problems. In fact, they just exacerbate some of them. Second, be explicit. You wanna be straightforward and be really clear about what your system is, uh, how it interfaces with the other parts of the world and with what you expect. Uh, being explicit is gonna help you in a lot of ways that are hard to quantify while you're just thinking of it abstractly. Uh, but it's sort of the, the first step toward any automation. If you don't write something down, if you don't document it, ideally in a format that's you know, programmatically readable, you're never gonna learn from it. 
you need to measure everything. Uh, if you're not measuring something, you just don't know it, and you certainly you're never gonna be able to automate it, right? Uh, this is the kind of stuff that is basic to say, but has a really profound effect in practice. And again, it's taken us from feeling like we sort of knew what we were doing to feeling like we're on top of any new issues that come up and that we can even uh, uh, proactively respond to things that are going to be a problem in the future. And finally, scaling. Uh, microservices are more complicated than monoliths. This is just a fact. You're introducing overhead, you get some nice benefits from it, but you can't just pretend that the way that you treated a monolith is gonna work in the new world. So automation is, is the obvious way to get around it. It feels really rewarding to pull off, uh, and it's gonna turn your team into uh, a bunch of people that are able to really focus on what they care about, building an application, delivering whatever the value is that you deliver, rather than a team that sits around and, and patches up after broken services. Uh, a couple of resources to just leave you with. Uh, those GitHub repos I mentioned for actual projects, Bravado and Pyramid Swagger for Swagger integration, and Elastalert for working with uh, Elasticsearch and doing monitoring there are all on GitHub. We have a long form article on our transition from uh, monolith to services, written by sort of the tech lead of our services team. Really well written, has a lot of background information. I haven't dove into even most of the issues that came up in that, so it's very interesting reading. And if you're more in the mood for something bite-sized, we have what are called our service principles. So this is all of the senior members of the teams that had been working on services for a long time at Yelp basically uh, got together and said, here's what we're gonna write down and here's uh, the summary of what we know. And with that, uh, we may have some time for questions and if you want to uh, get in touch with me after those work and also the hallway, I'll be at uh, the Yelp booth. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, time for a couple of questions. Hi, um, I know you said uh, APIs need to be, you know, you need to get them right as much as possible from the start, um, but you don't always do that. And um, so how do you deal with API versioning? Do you, do you have a tool for that set of best practices, something like that? Sure, Thanks. sure. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. Obviously, we did not get it right at the start, and we continue to version our APIs. Uh, we've, we're still solving this. I would say that the best suggestions I have are we really appreciate at least documenting the interface you have. That's a great first start, because it will make you realize when you need to version your API. And then as far as interacting with them, we've been mostly just treating them like any other endpoints. You know, you need to make sure that you make a V2, you can have clients then switch over to use it. All these logs that you're collecting will let you monitor when V1 is actually completely dead, rather than you just don't know of any consumers right now. Uh, so those tools can, can help you out. I don't think I have any sort of uh, uh, plug-in solution for the overall problem, though. Yeah. So thank you for your talk. Uh, in the beginning, you said that not only did you want to address complexity, but also wanted to interact with different languages and decouple that as well. Now, all the tooling and everything you've shown was in Python, which is great because we're at EuroPython. I was still wondering, um, did you end up uh, using other languages uh, in your system? We do use other languages. So Yelp is, um, I would say, 95% Python, ballpark. Um, we have Java services uh, for the more high-performance high stuff and for the search stack. And uh, we don't, to my knowledge, currently have any cross-language talk, but the beauty of Swagger in particular is it's data, right? It's not code. Your schema is written down in data, your schema can be read in JSON, and there do exist plenty of Java-based clients for Swagger. So uh, we definitely focused on making sure that would work cross-language. I, I don't wanna misspeak and say that we have yet. I think we're in the process of doing so. Um, did you look into uh, the REST constraints and more specifically hypermedia formats in order to get a more decoupled system? Did that help? Anybody? Yeah, uh, I can say that we talked a lot about hypermedia. Uh, I, I can't say that we went much beyond that. I think for our money, we've been uh, busy with much more practical, that, that's sort of like all the way on the top of the, the pyramid of needs, you know, when you've got everything else nailed, maybe you'll do hypermedia. Uh, we're, we're still working our way through some more fundamental issues. So, and, and these kinds of you know, uh, low level issues are way before you get to the point of nice hypermedia APIs. So that's kind of where we are in the evolution, yeah. 
Um, with Elastalert, what's the lead time from like, bad requests starting to hit your servers to them being fed to the log processor, you know, searched and then getting an alert? Like, sure. Do you mean theoretically or in our system? I mean in your system. In our system. Uh, so it doesn't, Elastalert doesn't care about how the data gets to Elasticsearch. Um, so depending on what your data generation scheme is, that matters a lot. For us, we use uh, scribe logging. We have uh, some bridges into Kafka for persistence. And I think the overall lead time to get into, uh, into Elasticsearch is on the order of 30 seconds, 10 seconds, so like low seconds on good times, and it can get delayed. Um, in practice, we find we can rarely react faster than that. So that's uh, been pretty excellent for us, yeah. And there's no reason you can't make it faster. We just haven't put in the effort to do so yet. Um, how do you handle uh, registration and governance of the services and the granularization? You know, how granular or what, you know? The, how do you know which backends to talk to? More about how do, you, how do you manage? You have many services inside, I guess, like different teams, and how you prevent, for example, reinventing the wheels, reusing. Oh. The service and so on. Yeah, so, so sort of how do we make sure that we aren't constantly redoing each other's work and all that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a few ways of doing that. We've sort of tried to, we have a service infra team that focuses on building tooling, right? Um, inevitably, they're also a source of a lot of expertise, so you're very much encouraged to go to them and discuss. We have a uh, sort of by, by similarity, something that's like PEPS. We have basically SCIF uh, a service uh, service reviews, basically. When you're designing something new, you put it out for review, you write a formal spec, and you say, uh, see if anybody likes it or has problems with it. So we have a lot of kind of human code review kind of processes like that. Um, and we've generally tried to make sure that services always have one coherent owner, a team. Um, we have one service sort of attached onto the side of the monolith that lets us access that data. And we've had a lot of trouble in the years that it didn't have an explicit team with it just sort of being a tragedy of the commons. So making sure someone owns it is very important, yeah. Okay, um, I think that's probably all the time we have for questions now, so I'm um, just a uh, raise your hand for a